Good morning and welcome to the first virtual <laughs> uh, South Carolina Archival Association annual meeting. Uh, I want to thank uh, our directors, Tracy Power and Tabitha Samuel for putting together uh, the sessions at this meeting. Uh, I want to thank the other members of the board, Catherine Slover, Graham Duncan, Jessica Cerro, Evan Spencer, for their help in setting up the meeting. I want to give a shout out to our webmaster, Angela Flenner, uh, who helped us put everything up on the SCAA website so that folks had the information that they needed. And I want to thank Clemson University, who is graciously allowing us to use their Zoom platform in order to host this meeting. Before we begin with the meeting prop, well, before we begin with the keynote, uh, just a bit of reflection. We acknowledge that the main campus of Clemson University occupies the traditional and ancestral land of the Cherokee people. Clemson's main campus is built on land seized through US military and diplomatic incursions, culminating in the Treaty of DeWitt's Corner in 1777. This is also land on which people enslaved by the Pickens, Clemson, and Calhoun families lived and worked, and that was transformed into the campus of Clemson University through convict labor. We make this acknowledgement to remember the histories of violence that anticipate our gathering here, to recognize indigenous and black claims to life and land, and to recenter those claims as we commit to better ways of caring for each other and for this land. Along with this acknowledgement, we ask, what responsibilities and commitments can we make to foster more honest, and generative relations with the land we occupy and with each other. Wherever you find yourself today and wherever you go, we encourage you to acknowledge indigenous claims to the land you occupy. Can learning about the life ways and life worlds of the original and rightful caretakers of the land we occupy guide our own changing relation with the places we are and the communities that belong to those places, how can we share our learning with others? Okay. And at this point, I am going to turn the meeting over to Tracy Power, who will introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Power. I am a historian at Newberry College and also the college archivist. And I'm one of the directors of the South Carolina Archival Association. We are delighted today to have Dr. Tiffany Moman with us. She is a public historian, a visiting assistant professor at Swanee, the University of South. With years of experience participating in the preservation of community histories. Her work has taken her throughout the Southeast, organizing community-based historic preservation projects. And I will tell you as a veteran of the South Carolina Historic Preservation Office, historic preservation does not work without community-based preservation projects. And so that's a very important aspect of her work. She's done that in locations such as Winston-Salem, North Carolina, the Alabama Black Belt, and the Kentucky segments of the Trail of Tears. She's also the founder and co-director of an exciting initiative called the Black Craftspeople Digital Archive. It's a humanities project that centers Black craftspeople, their lives, and their contributions to the making of Building of America. Throughout her career, she's lectured on the subject of Black craftspeople at organizations such as the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, the Historic Charleston Foundation, Winterthur Museum and Gardens, the Daughters of the American Revolution Museum, and others. And we are delighted to have Dr. Moman as our opening keynote speaker this year. Thank you very much. 
Welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to take a moment to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen okay? All right. So good morning and thank you, Tracy, for that introduction. Thank you all for having me today. It is an honor to be here with you today on the occasion of your annual conference. It is also a special day because it happens to be the one year anniversary of the Black Crafts People Digital Archive. So I'm very excited about that. Before I jump into it, I wanted to begin this morning with a story. In late May of 1750, John Williams, formerly known as Quash, walked from his home near the Naval Office in Charleston, South Carolina, to the office of the South Carolina Gazette at the corner of Trad and King Streets. Williams' visit to the office of the South Carolina Gazette was to place an ad in the newspaper for his carpentry and joinery services. Of his services, Williams wrote, John Williams, carpenter and joiner, living near the Naval office in Charlestown, gives notice that he is ready and willing to undertake all manner of carpenters and joiners work or any buildings that shall be thought proper to be offered to him. And as he is a free man, he promises that whoever shall please to employ him shall find not only their work well done and handsomely finished, but with great fidelity, justice, and dispatch. All persons favored in employing him will with the greatest attitude be, gratitude be acknowledged by their most humble servant, John Williams. From his trip to the office of the South Carolina Gazette, Williams returned to his work site of the Charles Pinckney Mansion located at the corner of East Bay and Ginyard Streets in Charleston. Although emancipated just two weeks before, Williams continued to work in his role of master carpenter at the mansion, overseeing the building's finishing touches. Meanwhile, Williams' carpentry work crew, highlighted in the red squares, um, consisted of several enslaved men owned by Charles Pinckney and others, and they continued to labor at the mansion under Williams' leadership. It was business as usual, Although Williams had done what few black men had done had, before him had ever had done by placing an advertisement in the South Carolina Gazette. The other men, women, and children enslaved by the Pinckneys might have reacted uh, with surprise when hearing of Williams' visit to the office of the South Carolina Gazette. Those same men, women, and children may have also been shocked to learn of Williams' emancipation. The both men and women, both free and enslaved, involved in 25 trades, from wheelwrights and tanners to cabinet makers and goldsmiths, who lived and labored in the 18th century South Carolina low country. We launched the beta or in testing version of the website on August 31st, 2020. Working together as a team, we consulted with digital humanists, GIS developers, archivists, and website designers, to complete what you see here. We are a fully self-funded project with no support from any larger organization or educational institution. Because of this, we have had to be creative, turning to open source so software such as WordPress and Omeka and calling in favors from as many people as we could. We knew that we were on the right path and we, ho we hoped to inspire others to join us on this journey. The website's homepage will bring you to this area where you can select different options to explore the website. Exhibits are soon to come, but available now are both the beta versions of the archive and the digital map. A click over to the archives page will bring you here where you can select different options to explore the website. I'm sorry, I lost my place, let's see. 
Yes, okay, a click over to the archives page will bring you here where you have the option to browse by collections organized by trade, use the search engine to find black craftspeople by keyword, or even to contribute your own research or knowledge on black craftspeople fully attributed to you. Browsing collections will bring you to a page where you can currently explore black craftspeople involved in 25 trades. The selection of a trade and craftsperson will bring you to that person's profile. The profiles are organized using Dublin Core and Library of Congress subject headings, and they include facts about the craftsperson's life, primary source documentation, in this instance, a runaway slave advertisement, and a transcription of that advertisement. In this example, we see the profile of an enslaved spinner named Judy. George Muckenfoos held Judy in bondage and, uh, and on August 25th, 1779, he placed a notice in the South Carolina Gazette that Judy had self-emancipated and left his bondage with a free man of color named Andrew. The second component of the BCDA is a digital map placing craftspeople on the landscape of the South Carolina Low Country. A click over to the maps page will bring you here where you have the ability to search the data in a variety of ways. You can search through the trade count section by clicking on the bar graphs of a specific trade. You can click this blue arrow to the left of the screen and search through this set of drop down menus. You can also skip both of those options and search by pie chart. Clicking a specific trade on the pie chart will show you individuals involved in that trade only. Each different trade, <clears throat> each different way you search will cause craftspeople uh, to be listed in the far right column. And those people change. Here I have highlighted bricklayers on the pie chart. And so we can see the stories of bricklayers populated in that column. If we switch back to the map view, you can see that each of the light gray dots on the map represent bricklayers. If you were to click one of those dots, you would then get this information box on London, an enslaved bricklayer who self-emancipated from Thomas Farr's plantation in St. Mark's Parish, Sumter County, South Carolina. Included in this box, if you scroll down, is a link that will take you to London's profile in the archive thus connecting the primary source and possibly only documentation of London's life to a location. Before we move on, I do want to show you what the map looks like for an urban area such as Charleston. So right now we are looking at Charleston and you can see landmarks such as Waterfront Park and well-known streets such as Broad Street and King Street. But I am most interested in this little blue dot on Meeting Street in the yellow square. Clicking that blue dot brings us to the story of Joe, an enslaved jeweler held in bondage by well-known Charleston jeweler, John Paul Grimke. Here, we've connected Joe to the location of Grimke's home and shop in 1771. And so if you've ever uh, visited the Wyndham Hotel there, you've been at the location of John Paul Grimke's shop. Um, where Joe self-emancipated from in 1771. Okay, so that was a very, very brief overview of the archive and map. And now I would like to talk about the why. Why the BCDA? First, the BCDA exists because of my research into the previously discussed John Williams and his work on the Pinckney Mansion. What I discovered by combing through the papers of Charles Pinckney and his wife Eliza Lucas Pinckney the couple that enslaved Williams, was that there were more enslaved craftsmen involved in the construction of the mansion. Not only that, but Pinckney was sending these craftsmen out across the city to perform work on his other properties and the homes of his friends. These enslaved craftsmen were leaving their mark and their little literal footprints across the city of Charleston. I soon found myself mapping the other locations of their work, and before I knew it, I had a test map and the inspiration to grow the map into something much larger. But most importantly, the other large, well-known uh, decorative arts archives and research centers with this type of data were not looking at the data the way that I was. 
One of those research centers boasts of having 90,000 known craftspeople, but of that 90,000, only 3,000 of those craftspeople are Black. I wanted a resource uh, to use that moved beyond traditional archival collections of craftspeople and the endless collection and cataloging of names. I wanted to better visualize the data. I wanted to ask more questions, interpret the data. I wanted to see these Black craftspeople. And I found that the best way for me to see them was through place. I wanted to facilitate discussions on movement, hence the creation of the map. And I found that there was just so much more to the story. And it became a situation for me um, where I was like in the words of the late Congressman John Lewis, if not us, then who, if not now, then when. And we're only beginning in this work. Our beta site is live, but there is so much more to come, and I'm really excited about it. And, you know, taking this chance really paid off for me in the project, as well as my team. Instagram is the way that we communicate best with the public. And, you know, we started this slow. I began by asking my friends to follow us and support. And now, a year later, we're up to 18.7 thousand followers, and we share the stories of Black craftspeople four days a week. And as you've seen, the sources that we're using in this beta launch of the website are one, runaway slave advertisements. We intentionally began with runaway slave advertisements. I was immediately interested in the descriptions of what um, self-emancipated craftspeople were taking with them. Were they taking tools? Um, and I was also interested in the descriptions of what they were wearing. Often you'll come across advertisements um, where it mentions that the self-emancipated people escaped wearing their work apron. There is so much in these advertisements that raises so many questions. Uh, for example, advertisements provide us with a wealth of information on not only practice trades, but also physical descriptions, literacy, language, why uh, these individuals self-emancipated, possible destinations, and more. In doing this work, I was inspired by the work of historians like Lorenzo Green, who began compiling this information on New England in the 1940s, and Lathan Windley, who began re-examining and compiling this data on the South back in the 1970s. In so many ways, the advertisements speak for themselves, but it is, it is up to us as scholars to analyze and interpret them. Continuing on the thought of why I thought the BCDA was necessary, I would like to build on one point that there is much more work to do. Some archives, museums, and historic sites have been historically complicit in the erasure of Black craftspeople from the narrative through a variety of techniques, the most common of which is just to ignore them. We've all been on problematic museum tours, right? And I can remember being on a tour in Tennessee in 2015 of a slave dwelling, which is pictured here on screen. And the architectural historian leading that tour uh, saying that there was no way that enslaved carpenters built the dwelling because it was overbuilt. It was built too well. I had to stop him and let him know that the primary source documentation, and you can see my ragged copy of, sl of Slavery in the Clover Bottoms on screen, uh, written by a gentleman named John McCline, details the construction of the building. And in John McCline's words, the voice of someone who was actually there, he said otherwise. Going forward, our work needs to combat that way of teaching and thinking. We've come far, but not far enough. It's not just enough to be a good museum or to be a good archive anymore. You know, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois told the public back in 1902 in his text, The Negro Artisan, that we were missing the larger story behind Black craftsmanship. And it certainly is a shame that some archives, museums, and historic sites still miss the larger story. And you know what else? This slave dwelling and this book, written by John McCline, provides all of the information that we needed to know about the craftspeople behind the construction of this dwelling and the construction of other buildings on the property. Mr. McCline left us a whole list pictured on screen, and I've included just a few of their names here. When that architectural historian made the claim 
that these enslaved individuals could not have been involved in the construction of this slave dwelling, he erased them from the record. He refused to acknowledge them and their forced labor. He refused to recognize their contributions. This story of my experience on the tour and Mr. McCline's story speaks to what we at the BCDA see as a significant problem, um, and that is the lack of recognition. On the screen is a pot made by uh, David Drake, an enslaved potter held in bondage in Ed Edgefield, South Carolina. We're lucky to know that Mr. Drake made these pots because he signed his name in them, along with a host of verses. But Mr. Drake was an exception. There are a few more examples of black craftspeople seeking recognition for their work by carving their name in, in the objects that they produced. Take these two examples from Bell Bellamy Mansion in Wilmington, North Carolina. The bottom picture is of a brick, and the name written in that brick is that of Charlie Fremont, a young boy and enslaved plasterer at Bellamy Mansion who wrote his name, I'm sorry, Charlie Fremont, a young boy working as a bricklayer during the construction of the mansion. Next is that of William Gould, who was an enslaved plasterer at Bellamy Mansion, who wrote his name on the back and edges of the plaster, never to be seen, and only found over 100 years later during the renovations. Seeing their signatures and initials is powerful. These men never thought that anyone would see the top of the plaster a design or the backside of a brick, yet they inscribed them anyway. Reflecting upon these two examples, it is apparent that for every one craftsperson that we do know and that we can connect to a specific object, there are thousands upon thousands more that we don't know. And this brings us to the unnamed. Other research centers that collect this data do not include records of the unnamed. We do. We believe that they deserve as much recognition as those people who are named in the records. They did not choose to go unnamed, and I am positive that they would have liked to been acknowledged by name for their labor and their artistry. When we at the BCDA think about recognition, one of the questions that we are frequently asked involves recognizing the roles of Black women. Researchers are interested to know about them and to know what crafts they were skilled in beyond needlework and sewing. I too asked myself those same questions, and my team and I worked and continue working um, to find more Black women to include in the archive. The majority of the Black women in our archive labored as needleworkers, knitters, or seamstresses. On the screen are runaway slave advertisements related to two Black women, Isabella, a needleworker on the left, and Charlotte, a seamstress on the right. Both women self-emancipated with their young children. And looking for enslaved or free black craftswomen involved in crafts beyond needlework and sewing, we happened to find a newspaper advertisement including the, in, advertising the sale of women accustomed to work in a brickyard. I am positive that as we increase our database, we will find more stories such as this one. Another question that we are frequently asked is if we know what happened to any of these black craftspeople after they either self-emancipated or were granted freedom. My colleague Victoria Hensley likes to point out that in many cases we don't know, but in other instances we see them appear again after attempting to self-emancipate once more, and sometimes we do know what happened to them. The chairs on screen were created by an enslaved and later freed craftsman named Richard Pointer. Pointer was born enslaved in Virginia and held in bondage by Robert Pointer of Halifax County. Robert Pointer and his family, including the enslaved individuals he claimed to own, relocated to Williamson County, Tennessee in 1816. In 1850, Richard Pointer placed ads in Tennessee newspapers and declared that he was a free man. Richard Pointer would go on to create a horse-powered chair factory in Williamson County, Tennessee, and teach the art of chair making to his family members. Some of Pointer's work and the work of his family is seen on screen, including the, the initials of an L Pointer who carved his name into the back of one of the chairs. 
I could talk about the stories of individual craftspeople for days, but before I move on, I just wanted to highlight one more story that I was just asked about this week. On Wednesday, a colleague of mine asked me if I'd ever come across a story involving a free black craftsperson helping an enslaved person self-emancipate. I was thrilled that I could tell him yes. By 1830, Louisville, Kentucky was home to a sizable free black community, which represented nearly one fifth of the um, black population of Louisville by 1860. One member of that community was Dudley C. Jones, a free man of color born in 1805. In 1853, police arrested Jones on the charge of aiding an enslaved woman named Mary in her escape from the person who held her in bondage. When Mary escaped, she was hidden in the home of Georgina Stevenson, a free black woman, and disguised as a boy when she was captured shortly before her relocation to Jones's home. While there is evidence that police arrested Dudley Jones, there is no evidence that he was sentenced for the crime, for the crime of aiding Mary. By 1858, Jones had returned to his life as a cabinet maker. On screen is the 1850 U.S. Census featuring an entry for Jones. The newspaper advertisement discussing his arrest, a city directory listing the address of his shop, and a Sanborn map indicating the location of his shop in what is now downtown Louisville are all on screen. These are the stories that we hope to inspire researchers to tell. So what's next for the BCDA? Number one is growth. When we wrap up our beta testing phase, we will be adding more craftspeople to the digital archive and the map. We are dedicated to providing the groundwork for scholars to do more research. In fact, we recently learned that our project, even in this very early stage, is being used in graduate coursework at Warren Wilson College in Swannanoa, North Carolina. And it is also being used in an undergraduate course at Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We want to be able to reach more audiences, facilitate more discussions, and encourage students and others who are involved in this type of work. Second, we are preparing to expand into more regions and to expand our time frame. As we move into areas such as Tennessee, we will be searching for Black people there through the year 1900. And on screen is a map showing our target areas for the next two years, including expanding our research in South Carolina. We'll um, launch Tennessee at the start of the new year. We're also working on research in Maryland, North Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. We also want to improve our crowdsourcing and increase contributions uh, to the digital archive. This project does not exist in isolation, neither do we want to work at this alone. We want to hear from as many people and institutions with this type of data as possible. We also want to work to encourage archives, museums, historic sites, and scholars to ask new questions of the sources and to look for silences in your collections. We've already been fortunate enough to work uh, with museums such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York as they plan new exhibitions involving Black craftspeople. We like to encourage that work and we'd like to hear from you if you are interested in highlighting the Black craftspeople in your collections. I cannot close out today without highlighting my wonderful team. They are the reason that I am able to be here with you today. I honestly cannot say um, enough things about them. And when I think about how far we've come in the last year, I, I get teary eyed. I'm, I'm getting teary eyed right now, actually. But I'm so grateful to have them on my team and to support the work um, that we're doing. And I'm so excited to see uh, where we're able to go next. And so a few um, closing thoughts before I ask for questions and also actually take you um, uh, to, the, to the website of the archive. I just want to reiterate that the Black Crafts People Digital Archive examines the impact of Black Crafts People on the value decorative arts, architecture, and handcrafts of the early American South. 
The BCDA merges history with geospatial analysis to present primary source documentation of black craftspeople alongside the locations in which they lived and labored. The BCDA examines previous historical absences and tells new stories that ultimately encourage users to re-examine objects and primary sources to tell a more comprehensive narrative of black craftspeople on the Southern landscape. As we continue to grow this exploration of African-American craftsmanship across the Southern landscape, we hope to unite the stories of African-American craftspeople who likely experienced the same trials and shared like experiences, making them closer to each other than their spatial distance would ever allow. Thank you. And now I am going to share um, the website. Here on screen, uh, this is the homepage um, that you can find at blackcraftspeople.org. And you can also connect to our Instagram feed here as well, where I mentioned that we share the stories of black craftspeople about four times a week. Um, and continuing, you do have the option that I mentioned earlier of visiting both the archive and the map. Um, clicking the archive link will of course bring you here. I do want to highlight um, really quickly that you do have the option to contribute materials here. Um, we'd love if you have any information on black trans people that you just happen to be researching. Um, if your archive or historic site has information about crass people, we'd love to share that information and attribute that to your institution, of course. Um, through the website, you also have the option to browse the collections. And here you can see the 25 total that we have so far. Um, and if we click a collection here, you can see Judy that I referenced earlier in the slides. Uh, but let's take a look here at one of the unnamed spinners. And what we do is we give each uh, craftsperson a unique identifier. Um, in this instance, this unnamed spinner is spinner number five, and she's knitter number three because she um, worked at, at two different crafts. And you can see here, um, the Library of Congress subject headings that we use, uh, list, we list the source, the date, uh, because right now we're working slowly with runaway slave advertisements, um, the name of her enslaver, and her home location of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we also include events here, um, and these events include everything from who they were enslaved by, um, who um, was selling them, whether or not they self-emancipated, whether or not um, they hired themselves out. And we include a transcription and of course an image um, of that um, advertisement in this case, which happens to be a um, for sale advertisement. Um, if we take a look at shoemakers, we can look at Mingo, who's shoemaker number one. And again, looking at those same um, categories, and we can see here that he self-emancipated from Jonathan, Maine, um, December 16th, 1732, in Charleston, South Carolina. And here's a look at that advertisement here. And you can also search. Um, so for example, if you were interested in seeing the women in our collection, um, you could search um, using the word female, and they will all appear um, for you here. And here are our brick makers um, that I referenced earlier in the presentation. One of the things that I love about going through these records and reading the stories, um, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm interested in what they took with them, but I'm also interested um, I like to think about why they might have self-emancipated. I'm a mother, I have three children. And so when you think about what it takes to self-emancipate from your enslaver and to take your children along, along with you. And in some of these instances, some of these women are taking babies or infants with them. Um, 
for me, it raises a lot of questions and, and uh, makes me think about a lot of, of different scenarios. All right, so if we were to go over to the um, maps portion of the website, um, it will bring you here. And I want to lay out a few specifics about the maps um, portion of the website. So because they're working in with data from the 18th century, our locations are not always 100% uh, accurate. Um, so say, for example, if we are looking at um, a crass person who self-emancipated from the plantation of his enslaver, we usually have a plantation name, but we don't usually have specific GPS coordinates um, for that specific plantation. So what we do in that instance is um, use the coordinates of the closest town or, or urban area. All right, so if you come to the map um, and we zoom in here, you can see um, some of the dots, uh, colored dots pertaining to trade. Um, over here, you have the craftspeople entries for all 399 people that are involved um, in the beta version of this site. And there are, as I mentioned, different ways to search. Um, so say, for example, I just wanted to see carpenters, I could click this bar graph here, and now I'll see entries for um, 131 carpenters. And if I click just the first one here, the map will zoom in, and it shows that this craft person, um, Johnny Holmes, um, he's actually a free man of color, is um, in Charleston, South Carolina. And again, if we click another, we can see, oh, I remember this story, actually. Um, he was in the Lake Farm Plantation that was later flooded. Um, so that's why he's appearing underwater. Um, and you can scroll out, look at the data in all um, different types of ways. If we wanted to say, um, search using this option by uh, craftsperson name, or maybe you have a Christopher Gadsden's home at uh, the northeast corner of East Bay and Vernon Streets in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, one thing that I do like about these entries is that if you were to scroll down, you can see the GPS coordinates that we used, but also you get this little link. And if you click that link, It's taking a little while, but it will take you back to that person's um, profile um, on the archives side of the website. Oh, there it goes, it finally loaded. All right, there he is. So it, it links that primary source to place. And um, I do want to show you that, um, if we move this one back, oh, the pie chart. So let's say, for example, um, you'd like to see more specifics around percentages of how many craftspeople that uh, we have and what trades they're working in. You can use the pie chart here to search in that way. Um, and let's see if we take a look at blacksmiths. You can click blacksmiths. Uh, that portion pops out, and those people populate over here. Um, in the, in the column on the right. And then if you were to click one of them and jump back to the map, you can see where they are on the map. One of my, I love data visualization. So this is one of the aspects of the website that I'm really excited um, to see as we move forward, um, looking at how these percentages change, thinking about, um, you know, what those numbers look like in comparison to others. So we can see that uh, the carpenters make up 32.83% of the 399. And then we can see we've got others here 
uh, that are very, very um, small, such as our, um, I believe I clicked needle workers, such as our needle workers here. Oh, we also are beta testing right now. Um, and this chart sort of changes weekly as we continue to test. But one of the things that we were interested in identifying was um, how many people were running uh, self-emancipating and when. And if you click the dots, you can see that, for example, um, 1742, we've located eight people that self-emancipated so far. And here are the trades that they were involved in. And so in thinking about the ways that we can use this data, um, one of the things that we thought about is how we connect this data um, to other forms of data. You know, is there, you know, a particular event that's happening in the low country that's causing a lot of people to self-emancipate? Um, I imagine that as, you know, as we continue to build the database and get closer to events such as the Revolutionary War, that we'll see these numbers increase. And you can also see because we're so early in the 18th century that we've picked up a few people self-emancipating um, in later years, but I'm sure as we add more during those years, um, the appearance of this chart will change. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the things also that I want to point out is that um, maybe you don't like the black and white of this um, particular map, we have options where you can change it if you would like to get more of a, of a street view similar to something like Google Maps. Um, you can do that as well. If you spend a lot of time in Charleston, um, you know, you can, we hope um, as the project continues to grow, we're thinking about potentially in year three, creating a digital app um, that allows you to have your cell phone out. And as you walk throughout these areas, you know, being able to see or stand in the in the um, places that we connected these crafts people to. And I'll click, you know, just a few more here. Oh, here's one. Um, Quamina the Cooper, he's at Thomas Rose's house in Charleston, South Carolina, and the Thomas Rose house actually still stands. So it's just another one of those um, really good in instances of connecting a craftsperson to place uh, to a place that still stands that you can still walk by and, and, you know, visualize or think about their experiences in that way. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and I am going to open up the floor for any questions. Okay, uh, we're getting some we're getting some questions. Um, the first one actually is from me. Okay. <laughs> wanted to, I wanted to, I started off and then suddenly everybody started adding things in, but I was kind of interested for craftspeople who have been involved in building buildings you know, for others who have been potters or seamstresses or that sort of thing, it would be far more difficult. But for th some that uh, have built buildings, does the database include a photo of the building if it still stands? So that's what we're hoping to do in our phase two. So um, what we were doing here in phase one was just making sure that what we had actually designed and, and planned actually worked. <laughs> Um, and so what we would like to do in phase two, much like you saw that pop up that um, if you click the craftsperson on the map, you get that pop up with all of the data. 
We hope to include a, a picture of the buildings that still stand, um, not only buildings, but maybe objects that we can connect to a specific craftsperson. Um, so for example, for example, what we're testing right now is having images of the Pinckney Mansion appear alongside the names of the craftspeople who are involved in its construction. So yeah, we definitely hope to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, first off, what an amazing project and thank you to you and your team for your work on this. You mentioned you are self-sustained. Does your team consist of all volunteers or do you have paid employees? So the way that we um, went about doing this was, um, you know, uh, being a, a recent graduate in the last two years, being a public historian, um, one of the things that I wanted to get away from was um, unpaid internships if I could help it. So what I actually did for our two graduate research assistants, um, Victoria Hensley, who is a PhD candidate at Middle Tennessee State University, and um, Sarah Grill, who just recently graduated from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. What I did for both of them was that I reached out to their graduate institutions and I asked them and negotiated with them to allow those students to work for me, but their school still pay them through their regular graduate um, research assistantships and it worked out well. Um, I was able to have them, instead of doing their you know, typical work for the, and contributing to their department, I was able to have them come work for me and still have their tuition covered and their assistantships paid. Um, in the case of me and uh, the co-director, Torin Gadsden, we of course are, are paid through our institutions where we work. Um, for everyone else involved, such as our web developer, we do pay her. Um, our, the gentleman who worked to make the maps for us is honestly, he's a friend of Dr. Gatson, and so he's working with us on faith right now. And, um, what we are doing, uh, we've applied for grants to pay him, um, through the, through the next sort of three phases of this project that we see, um, that we see happening. And so writing those grants, um, um, will cover his part of the salary. And then we include stipends for other people um, who are involved in working with us, such as our consulting archivist, Sarah Calise. Okay, thank you. By the way, that question came from Jessica Cerro. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Josh Johnson. Uh, his first one, first off, he says, thanks for sharing this excellent project. Uh, he says, looking through the sources, have you, have you found that the descriptions of black craftspeople are largely coming from runaway ads or from people being hired out by their enslavers? So we started with that first data set of runaway slave advertisements. And then from there, uh, we began to comb newspapers. So what you'll see is our progress as, as, we, as we slowly made our way uh, from those advertisements to advertisements seeking to hire um, people out. So right now the database is heavier on the runaway slave advertisement side, uh, but the South Carolina Gazette and its subsequent iterations uh, do include lots of advertisements on um, um, <clears throat> for enslavers seeking to hire craftspeople out. Um, sort of waiting in the queue to come up onto the website right now are about 600 more names. And I know that in those names, because of the way that we collected the data, we have more of that information on um, enslavers seeking to hire uh, craftspeople out. But what also becomes interesting with that data is that uh, we found more and more instances of craftspeople hiring themselves out unbeknownst to their enslavers. So their enslavers are putting ads into the newspaper that basically say, hey, if you spot this man um, do, and he asks you for a job, you know, don't hire him because he's been basically hiring himself out behind my back and keeping all of the money. Um, so those in instances have been um, really interesting and I'm, I'm hoping we'll find more. Okay, the second part of his question. Additionally, have you broken down where self-emancipated people were headed? 
if it is listed in the primary sources. I see Peter, a self-emancipated man from, Greenville, from the Greenville area, was believed to be headed to St. Augustine. Do the, do the other articles typically have information like this? Yes, they do actually. Uh, one of the things that we've been testing as for one of our potential phase two maps is connecting the crafts people to other potential locations that they're connected to. Um, so, you know, right now they all appear on the map as, as a dot, but what would that look like if that dot then had uh, lines that extended that show the other um, connection uh, locations where they might potentially be. You know, one of the things that about these advertisements, and this is such a, a great question. Thank you so much for this, Josh. Uh, one of the things about these advertisements is they are so detailed that they're basically a form of surveillance. They're an early form of the surveillance of black bodies on the landscape. And these enslavers, of course, they see these people as property. They want this property back. So what they're doing is they're saying, you know, for example, Tiffany ran away on uh, Friday. Um, she has a mother that lives in New York. She has a father uh, that lives in Georgia. She was once enslaved in, on a plantation in South Carolina. And so they're listing all of these advertisements to give people an idea of, if you see this craftsperson who is, you know, wearing a, an orange dress, and headed in one of these routes. If you find yourself in, in New York or Georgia or South Carolina, keep an eye out, right? And so um, looking at the potential places that they might have gone um, is so interesting. And one of the things that pops up often in these advertisements is um, enslavers basically saying, for example, um, uh, that this particular uh, self-emancipated craftsperson is um, being harbored by other um, enslaved people in Charleston. And I always think about, um, you know, we know that, um, we know how large the, the population of, of black people was in Charleston in, the, uh, in, in South Carolina in the 18th century. So one of the things that I like to think about are all of the ways and the methods that these self-emancipated crafts people are able to, to sort of blend in um, into those black communities in Charleston. And I think about the, what I've just been calling networks, right? Um, of of, of um, craftspeople and, and just other enslaved people in general in Charleston who are providing harbor for those individuals who self-emancipated. Um, one of the things that often stands out to me that I often wonder, is there a way that we can sort of capture this really well on a map? But one of the things that I think about is, you know, when I first started the presentation, I highlighted the path that Don Williams might have taken uh, from the Pinckney Mansion to the offices of the South Carolina Gazette. And one of the things I often think about is, you know, what did he see on that path from point A to point B? Uh, who might he have stopped and talked to along the way? Um, did he take that route? Did he take another route? Was there potentially a place um, was he, you know, potentially um, not wanting to walk past uh, the Vendu range where they would sell enslaved people in Charleston? Or did he not want to walk past the jail or, you know, any of these things? So when we think about the ways, um, what it means to be a, a Black person in 18th century Charleston and to walk about the city, even as a free man um, like John Williams, one of the things that I'm always cognizant about is... Um, just which routes, which streets were they taking to get from point A to point B? I have a question from uh, Tracy Power. Might there be opportunities for the BCDA to share information with Joe's McGill's slave dwelling project and for the slave dwelling project to share information with the BCDA. It seems as if the too often neglected connection between history and place is the true future of trying to ensure that more of the previously unknown enslaved will be acknowledged not only for their work but also for their personhood. Oh yes, that's. A, I would love to um, partner with um, Joe McGill and the Slave Dwelling Project. I've been a follower of his work um, for years now, and the work that he does in in highlighting place and the importance of place um, 
is, is so integral to, to what we do here. So yes, I could definitely see there being uh, potential um, collaborations or partnerships. Okay, we have a question. Uh, by the way, Josh says, thanks for your answers. Uh, question from Beth Bilderbach. Drayton Hall has been researching and presenting interesting information and stories about the enslaved people there. Are there plans to reach out to similar sites? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I'll actually be giving a another um, lecture at Drake. Um, what makes it so interesting to me in my research specifically um, was that it was often thought that John Williams, who I mentioned earlier, was the carver and the carpenter behind the construction of Drayton Hall. So just through a close reading of the, re, um, of the primary sources here recently, we realized that he wasn't, but it, it was good to, to think about. <laughs> Uh, but yes, definitely. So, um, you know, we're very open to collaborations. I mentioned that um, earlier, it's, we are working on a collaboration with the uh, Met Museum in New York on an exhibition coming up in 2022 on David Drake, and we'd like to expand those uh, potential collaborations. You know, we, we very much see this as us, the BCDA, just being facilitators of conversations. We very much so see ourselves bringing people together, to discuss black crafts people and, and the objects they created in their lives, experiences, and, and the artistry behind everything. Um, so sure, we'd love to collaborate with anyone who was interested. Does anyone have any more questions? Ah, okay. Uh. Perhaps you said this in your talk. This is from Willie McCree. But are there plans to continue to other states? I'm a North Carolina native and would be interested. Oh, absolutely. So our next upcoming states, we will continue. Um, and each time we bring a state on, we continue working in our previous state. So we still, we still have data and are still collecting data on South Carolina. Uh, but we're bringing on Tennessee. We have two more graduate students starting with us um, in November, one working on Baltimore and one working on Georgia. And the research assistant that we presently have, Sarah Grail, is handling our um, latest North Carolina research. So yes, if you have you know, anything that you'd like to contribute, if, if, if you're interested in working with us and working with me and Sarah Grail on that, uh, please shoot me an email. I will um, type it into the um chat here and yes we definitely be happy to have um to, to have you okay uh just the comment from tracy i tell my friend joe mcgill that he's getting into john lewis's good trouble, necessary trouble. And he's so glad you quoted John Lewis in your introduction. And I'm inspired by your and your teams doing the same thing. Godspeed to you all. And our next question, and please forgive me, I know that I'm going to mispronounce this name. So asking for absolution ahead of time. Aisha Hackle, this is a great project. In your research, have you located much information about religious affiliation of the self-emancipated? Yes, we actually have. So um, John Williams, who I've mentioned several times already, uh, was baptized into the Anglican Church at St. Philip's. And when he, his birth name was Quash, and then when he was baptized into the Anglican Church, uh, his name was changed to John Williams. And so we do know that um, he was baptized by the Reverend Alexander Garden there. In fact, um, he and Alexander Garden were extremely close. Um, I'm almost positive Alexander Garden um, was the individual who taught him how to read. Um, Alexander Garden ran a free school or ran a school for um, uh, free and enslaved people in, in Charleston. Um, additionally, um, John Williams 
met his wife. I'm positive he met her at St. Philip's because she also has a baptismal record there. Um, so both of them were in the Anglican Church. Additionally, um, we have come across the story of a, and he's written his own memoir. I would encourage anyone to Google it, but it's a black craftsman by the name of Boston King. And he was a carpenter in Charleston and his memoir talks about his experiences being enslaved in a carpentry shop in Charleston, just what that entailed. Um, but it also talks about his experiences uh, self-emancipating during the Revolutionary War. Um, he goes on to become a minister, and if I'm remembering correctly, he um, eventually settles in Canada. Um, so those are the two best examples I can think of right now of um, uh, people with religious affiliations, but we do hope to find more. Okay, do we have any more questions? We've got time for one more, I believe. Don't forget to put it in the chat. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So Tracy, I will turn it over to you to go ahead up. Oh, somebody just did. For institutions considering digital humanities projects, what are some tips you've picked up that you would share? Oh boy, <laughs> I do want to, you know, um, the closest thing I'd ever come to a digital humanities project was I, I used to have a blog years ago. So launching this project was all very new to me. So what I did was um, I connected to the folks. Um, I live in the Nashville, Tennessee area. So I connected to the folks at Vanderbilt University's Digital Humanities Lab. And they have been so awesome. I attend all of their training workshops. Uh, we email each other very frequently when I have questions. But I also sought out help from other people who were, um, who had active digital humanities projects. Um, <clears throat> one of those initiatives is the, um, it's the African American Digital Humanities Initiative out of the University of Maryland. Uh, run by a, um, a former colleague of mine named Dr. Aaliyah Brown. So she's been very, um, very, she's provided a wealth of information on understanding how to launch digital humanity sites. Uh, but one thing that I do like to encourage people to do is to just try it. Um, I, you know, when I first started playing around with this, I had no idea you know, this time last year, to, you know, today's technically our anniversary, this time last year, I had no idea it would end up looking the way that it did. Um, and then one of the things, too, that I, um, in doing the digital humanities, I realized that quickly that um, I can't do it by myself. And so that I needed to call in experts. So I needed to call in a web developer to do things, uh, you know, beyond my skill set, such as coding and things of that nature. And while I've picked up a little bit, I'm, I'm still really comfortable um, seeking out others where that type of work is their expertise. Um, and I would say beyond that, um, I've, you know, if there's been a, co a conference on the digital humanities that happened between, uh, that ha has happened in the last year, there's a 90% chance that I was there <laughs> just trying to soak up as much information as I possibly could to talk to people, to ask questions, um, and, and basically to, 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 to sort of face my fear. I wanted to make sure that if I was creating this project, uh, that I understood how it worked inside and out. Okay. Uh, just comment that from Tabitha Samuel that this is a remarkable resource. Thank you for sharing. And okay. now I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. <laughs> uh, then. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. This is a this really is a remarkable resource in terms of using technology and archives and place in a way that I think people aren't used to. Historians 
and archivist, and I'm both. Uh, we're so used to using the sources in traditional ways that sometimes we limit ourselves unconsciously. And I think this project is an, a wonderful example of what can be done with archives, not only to make the history more understandable, but to make the people who inhabited the past come to life as human beings. Wow. And I think, I think that's something that is, uh, we, don't in, we don't usually intentionally do it, but I think sometimes we're just so used to the way things have always been done. We, we limit the possibilities that we have. So thank you so much. This is a, a wonderful start to our conference. Thank you for having me. Okay, the, the next session will be at 10, so we'll see all of you there.